All right, well, it's a pleasure to be back again. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, so this year I wanted to talk about um, immune dysregulation disorders for somebody here, some of the fellows and things, they hear about this all the time, so this is uh, not, won't be uh, that much new here. But uh, anyway, um, we'll uh, go through this. Be, uh, you know, be happy to take questions as we go if you have questions. Um, and uh, so we'll just take it from there. So um, these are my disclosures. Um, and uh, so with that out of the way, the, the topics that I wanted to talk about um, revolve around a few things. So I wanted to give some background to these um, sort of this idea of immune dysregulation disorders, primary immune dysregulation disorders. So, so, you know, we talk about primary immunodeficiency disorders, and, and I'll explain what I mean by that and, and what the difference with an immune dysregulation disorder is. I'm going to talk just a brief review of IPEX and sort of um, where that has come and um, uh, where that stands now, and then um, other IPEX-like disorders. So these are um, disorders of where the immune system is dysregulated, um, and uh, patients don't get so much... They don't have so many problems with um, infections, per se. They have more problems with autoimmunity. So these are disorders that, that have uh, problems with autoimmunity primarily, and, um, and, they, and, and so that's the, the way that patients tend to present. And we're going to talk a little bit about treatment in the end um, and uh, uh, treatment of these specific disorders. So just to remind you, so... Um, Remember that, and I've shown this before, that uh, you know the, the world of primary immunodeficiency has really uh, grown a lot since we started doing this. This is the STEAM textbook of, uh, of primary immunodeficiency, ooh, no, of primary immunodeficiency diseases, or, or sorry, of, of I should say clinical immunology, immunology disorder. So, um, and as you can see, ooh, sorry about that, keep jumping all over. So. So on the right, there is the first edition. That was published in 1973, okay? So at this point when it was published, we didn't even know that much. I mean, we knew that there were different types of lymphocytes. We probably, you know, we knew that there were B cells and T cells. Maybe we didn't know so well how to characterize them. The third edition, of course, in, in 83, and then the, the genetic revolution really in, in uh, primary immunodeficiency diseases began in the early 90s and has really exploded. And... Um, the first molecularly defined immunodeficiency was defined by Eula Giblet here at the University of Washington. Uh, she was a, uh, a hematologist uh, and, um, and biochemist who, uh, who identified uh, adenosine deaminase deficiency, and then that but it was defined enzymatically, and that happened in, um, in uh, 1971, actually, just prior to the first edition. And, and then, in, like I said, the early 90s, the, gen the genes started to be connected to immunodeficiency diseases, and we now have about... 300 in the neighborhood of 300 um, ge genetic single gene defects that cause primary immunodeficiency. And so the field has really exploded. And I think the, the thing to think about is sort of how the field has changed. And, and I, you know, I've seen a change even in um, my career. Uh, the, the original paradigm of primary immunodeficiency diseases was that these um, clinicians, these very astute clinicians, so... Um, Got some of the ones that some of these early diseases were, were um, named after, so Bruton and Wiscott and Aldrich. So, so these astute clinicians identified these patterns of disease, and, and typically it was patterns of infections. The infections were oftentimes uh, rare or opportunistic organisms in these patients that were originally identified. Autoimmunity was rarely described, partly because... Um, this was, of course, um, prior to the, to the uh, point of having a lot of antimicrobials, uh, and so um, these patients would get sick with these unusual infections, and then they would die, and so they never really had a chance to develop autoimmunity. Um, and then, uh, as, it, uh, as noted here, that these diseases were often uh, onset was early, and they, they typically had early lethality as well. Compare that to the paradigm that we have today, where... Um, the immunodeficiencies, there's really a, a, a two arms of the, in, of the immune system where we see defects. So there's the effector arm of the immune system where, um, you know, this is the part of the immune system that's attacking and, you know, pre preventing infection. 
And then there's the regulatory arm of the immune system, which is the part that keeps everything else in check and keeps, you know, ma maintains immune tolerance and all of that. And we now know of a number of um, disorders in, in both arms of the immune system. And the ones that I'll focus on today are the immune dysregulation disorders, which are primarily the regulatory ones. But what this has done is there's really been this transition in terms of the way that we practice in the immunodeficiency clinic. So on the side of the, of the, the immunodeficiency disorders, the ones where the problems with effector mechanisms, you know, these are now becoming largely molecularly defined. So, so we're getting to the point that we can give a molecular diagnosis, a genetic diagnosis, to a very substantial portion of our patients in the clinic. It's probably approaching in the, the 40 to 50 percent range that we're able to give people a um, molecular diagnosis. And one of the things that's come out of this um, is uh, what I call fuzzy phenotypes. And, and um, what I mean by this is that, as noted at the bottom, of course, we still need clinicians in the clinic to uh, do the physical exams, to take the history and all of that. But we now partner in the clinic uh, very closely with the machines. We partner with gene sequencers. We partner with flow cytometers. And it's really this combination of really utilizing and, and applying these technological advances that have allowed us to really move this field forward like we have. And what I mean by fuzzy phenotypes is that I used to think that I was a reasonably good diagnostician, and I could sort of recognize patterns of disease, and I'd say, oh, this looks like a Wiscott Aldrich, and boom, or this looks like a common variable immunodeficiency, and, you know, and, and what I've come to realize is that I'm actually a very poor diagnostician, um, because as we have identified these diseases clinically and based on clinical criteria, we now do the genetics, and it turns out that um, one genetic defect can have a whole bunch of phenotypes. So, uh, for example, um, uh, STAT1 gain-of-function patients. So originally described as patients who had um, chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. Then there was the recognition that some of these patients, a subset of these patients, can have a lot of autoimmunity, and they actually live in our IPEX-like cohort. And I'll talk about them in a little bit. And then there was the recognition that, oh, some of these patients actually have a phenotype more like common variable immunodeficiency, and they live in that cohort. So now um, I see patients, and I see them clinically, and I go, could be a whole bunch of different genes. And so that's why we, we utilize these next generation sequencing approaches where we can sequence a whole bunch of genes at once. Because, you know, you can predict sometimes, but, it, but we've realized that these phenotypes are quite broad. And, and um, I think that has um, been, uh, at least for me, that has been uh, sort of revealing. I think the other thing which I which I talked about in, 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 I think maybe I talked about it last year, is that we now know from from sequencing of a lot, a, a fair number of these patients, that that old adage that was taught by our medical school professors, which is, you know, find the one unifying diagnosis may not be possible because, in fact, there are patients, uh, about 5% of patients, who have two unifying diagnoses, two genetic diagnoses. We have patients who have two uh, genetic defects that both cause primary deficiency, and their clinical phenotype is some blending of those two genetic defects. So, so I think that um, that has created additional fuzziness. Um, now, we now know that some of the infections that we see in patients with effector defects are not just these rare or opportunistic infections. Now we're finding um, molecular defects where patients are susceptible to common infections, so susceptible to recurrent strep infections, recurrent staph infections, um, particularly, and so or, or candida infections. So um, that has really been a transition on the on the immunodeficiency side, and um, and now autoimmunity is quite frequently decided, described in patients with uh, primary effector defects because again we're keeping patients alive for longer. And if you've got problems in the effector compartment, well, then there's a chance that you're going to ultimately have problems with autoimmunity. And so I think um, that's been sort of a transition. On the immune dysregulation side, many of the same things have happened. Again, the, the phenotypes are, are fuzzy among these patients. And in these patients, it's like I said, it's not so much that they're presenting with infections. They're presenting with autoimmunity as their primary presentation. So these are patients that really prior to recognizing these genetic defects, they lived in the rheumatology clinics, they lived in the GI clinics, they lived in the pulmonary clinics maybe, 
Um, but these are patients who have primarily autoimmune disease. And the onset can be early or late, and we're learning that some of these defects have a huge clinical heterogeneity. So, so that's the background, and I think that it's really, it's been, a, it, you know, it's, it, it's an exciting time to be an immunologist because we have all of this molecular knowledge now. That's going to be spreading and, and expanding even more. And so, um, I, you know, I think um, it's, uh, it's a great time to be, to be uh, practicing. So, um, I wanted to just talk about sort of the, the, the paradigm for these diseases that, the, the, the one that I'm biased, but this is the disease that, one of the diseases that my lab studies, and so, so um, you know, I think this is really the paradigm for these immune dysregulation disorders, and that's this, um, this disease called IPEX syndrome. Some of you uh, have heard me talk about this before. This disorder uh, was described first clinically um, in, uh, in this pu publication in 1982 by Powell, and it was it was uh, it was a family uh, that, uh, as you can see, very large family. Um, and actually, I need to add a few more a few more boys on here that have been affected. We've continued to follow this family. Um, they had this disorder that had early onset uh, bowel disease, so so autoimmune enteropathy. Uh, Many of the patients had um, uh, early onset uh, autoimmune endocrinopathies, so type 1 diabetes or thyroid disease, and m many of the patients had uh, dermatitis, so usually eczema. The one tricky thing about this original family was that there, most of the kids got sick early, so before the, the first, uh, within the first year of life, um, and many of them in this family died by uh, two to three years of age of just overwhelming autoimmune disease. But, but there were a couple of members of this family, a couple of affected boys in this family, that um, um, lived longer. There was one that actually lived into his early 30s. He's actually the oldest patient we know of with this disease. Um, and it turned out to be because of the mutation that they had, which ended up in this first family being a little tricky, and, and uh, I may come back to that if I've got time. But, um, um, so, You'll note here that this looks like an inheritance pattern that is consistent with, um, with an X-linked recessive form, an a form of inheritance where the mothers carry the disease, the boys get the disease, and, and are affected and then die uh, if, um, if they're affected. Now, the, this is sort of a typical presentation of one of these patients uh, with severe early onset autoimmunity. This is a patient that we had who presented with watery, uh, foul-smelling stool beginning shortly after birth. He had failure to thrive because of this. He had malabsorption. He had dry skin and eczema by two weeks of age. He presented with diabetic ketoacidosis at eight weeks of age. He had cytopenia, um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia that developed shortly thereafter. And he underwent um, a mesh related donor bone marrow transplant using a reduced intensity uh, conditioning regimen, which is, I'll come back to later, is, is our treatment of choice, really, for these patients for, for the long term. Had a very complicated transplant course. Um, he, was, he was a brittle diabetic. He was on, um, he was on uh, an insulin pump. Uh, it was actually on an insulin drip for most of his transplant, transition to an insulin pump. And um, his diarrhea got better, really, with the conditioning regimen. So you get rid of all of these autoaggressive cells and they're during the conditioning and the diarrhea goes away. A lot of the autoimmunity actually resolves at that point. But his diarrhea, his diabetes persisted and, and about a year at post-transplant, um, the parents noticed that they weren't needing to get, that his insulin requirements were going down and, um, and ultimately he was able to come off insulin uh, a little more than a year post-transplant after being a very brittle diabetic uh, during his transplant. And, um, I'll come back to that a, a little bit later. I think it's interesting. So, um, the disease actually, uh, we've known about this disease, we know that we knew about this disease, but we've known about this disease in an animal model for an even longer time than we've known about it in the human. So, this, this um, mouse uh, model called Scurfy uh, arose out of a spontaneous, it was a spontaneous mutation in a non-irradiated colony at Oak Ridge National Laboratories. In the uh, back in the 50s, actually, is when this mouse arose. Also noted to have an excellent pattern of, of inheritance of a severe wasting disorder. So the, the mice would be born, they looked completely normal, then they developed diarrhea, they developed wasting, they developed 
this um, scruffy, kind of um, flaky skin, and, and in fact, so much skin inflammation that the tips of their ears actually fall off, and their tails get sort of scruffy and fall off. And uh, so it's a very, sort of a very aggressive dermatitis in the mice, and they die by about three weeks of age of just this overwhelming lymphoproliferative um, autoimmune phenotype. And um, about every 10 years after the, mi after the mice were identified, there would be a study that would come out that would tell us a little bit more about this interesting mouse model. And, and so one of the first things that was realized is that you could take the CD4 positive T cells from these mice, you could transfer those to an olympopenic mouse, like a nude mouse or a skid mouse, that mouse who received that would uh, now develop the exact same phenotype as the scurfy mouse, and it would die within three weeks. Okay? And so it suggested that the whole disease was primarily driven by these CD4, these out-of-control CD4-positive T cells. They also realized subsequently that if you mixed in some normal CD4-positive T cells that the, and, and did the adoptive transfer, that the mice would not develop disease. That they wanted to be just perfectly happy, even though they continued to have engraftment with these scurfy CD4-positive T cells. So it suggested that there was some regulatory um, cell in normal cells that was keeping in check these scurfy T cells. And so that was the idea. Ultimately, the gene was identified by traditional uh, uh, positional cloning me uh, methods in the mouse, actually here in Seattle uh, and, and up in Bothell in a, uh, in a biotech company. And, uh, and then uh, the, the link was made then to the human disease. And, and the gene that was identified is this, this gene called FOXP3. And, and many of you, or probably most of you, have heard about this gene. So this is, um, it was realized from the, the um, um, sequence that it had homology to this large family of DNA binding proteins known as 4 head DNA binding proteins. So there's this 4 head domain, the, the, uh, denoted by FKH on the right. <clears throat> there uh, are some other interesting interaction domains that, uh, that were noted in the protein. There's a leucine zipper and a zinc finger, and then this, this upstream domain that's proline-rich that we now know is related to some of its repressor, gene repressant uh, activities. And so um, based on homology, this thing looked like a transcription factor. And most of these 4 head DNA binding proteins are involved in, it's a large family, that most of them are involved in patterning and development in different tissues. And that turns out to be the case here. So FOXP3, it turns out, is required for the patterning and development of regulatory T cells, as, as I'll come back to in just a minute. So um, uh, on the bottom of this, uh, you'll note that there are a number of, of uh, uh, symbols. Um, those denote where the mutations have been identified. Uh, the ones in blue are the mutations that we've identified here in Seattle, and the ones in red are the ones that have, that have been identified elsewhere. And as we found more and more mutations, um, a few things have sort of uh, emerged. One of them is that these mutations tend to cluster in important functional domains, so, which makes a lot of sense. But, uh, so the DNA binding domain is, is an important site for mutations. The zinc finger, or sorry, the leucine zipper. Uh, is an important site. There actually are not many mutations in the zinc finger. And then, of course, in this upstream domain, this uh, domain that we know, uh, this proline-rich domain in, in the upstream region that is required for the repressive function of FOXP3, we've also found a number of mutations. And <coughs> we now know that there's about, there, there are these three mutations that I've boxed, um, or actually four mutations, two of them the, are, are, are single amino, uh, deletion, amino acid deletions that are right next to each other. Um, these mutations are sort of hot spots. They account for about a third of all patients with disease. Uh, and these patients with these mutations tend to have somewhat milder disease. So we're actually identifying patients in adulthood now with these mutations. So this is a disease we used to, you know, I used to really push and, and talk to pediatric gastroenterologists. Now I find myself talking more to, to, try, to adult enero, uh, a gastroenterologists to try and get them to think about at least screening for this disorder in patients with long-standing disease. One of the things that is evident about these patients is, yes, they may, they may come to us and may be diagnosed in adulthood, but they've had symptoms pretty much their entire lives. Um, and so the, the, the disease still starts early, but then, um, uh, but it, um, you know, it doesn't, it's not lethal in these patients with quote-unquote milder mutations. They certainly don't have an easy life, but they, uh, you know, they have a lot of clinical morbidity, um, but they manage to survive even with um, sort of haphazard immune suppression, I would say. 
So, subsequent to the identification of this gene, um, it was recognized that this uh, protein, FOXP3, is required for the development of functional regulatory T cells. And so, this is, um, let's see if I can do this without getting the, I don't know where the, um, yeah, the pointer is, there it comes, all right, perfect. So, this is gated on the CD4 positive T cells, and so FOXP3 on the y-axis, CD25 on the x-axis, and the and natural regulatory T cells are these, these CD25 positive, FOXP3 positive cells that are in the, um, the uh, CD4 positive T cell population. And so, so these, um, these T cells, these regulatory T cells, typically make up between 4 to 7 percent of the, of the uh, peripheral CD4 T cell population. And you see in a patient with a severe mutation in FOXP3 that there's no protein expression and you don't see any of these regulatory T cells. And so this is a disease of um, lack of regulatory T cells. And if you think about what regulatory T cells do, their, their job is to really maintain uh, immune tolerance um, after the thymus. So the, the T cells develop in the thymus, the regulatory T cells develop in the thymus, and then the regulatory T cells are the main mechanism by which immune tolerance is maintained out in the periphery. They sort of uh, keep a handle on, on the activity of all of the other immune cells. And they keep, keep things quiet, you know, things might get revved up to respond to a viral infection, but then the regulatory T cells move in and they uh, sort of tell those other cells, you know, you've responded enough, it's time to settle down and take it easy now. Uh, and so, you know, take, and, and so, uh, take, take a break. And so that's what they do. And so these patients essentially have an immune system, their effector compartment seems to be fine. They can get revved up just fine. We don't see, you know, they get viral infections, they get fungal infections, they get bacterial infections, but they can clear those. It's not a problem in effector mechanisms, it's a problem with controlling those effector mechanisms. So it's like an immune system with no breaks. And so, just to remind you about regulatory T cells and, and what they are and what they do. So, so again, the naturally arising regulatory T cells, they arise in the thymus, and they're generated there. Um, the first place that we see CD4 positive, FOXP3 positive th cells is in the thymic medulla. So remember that T cells come into the thymic cortex, they rearrange their T cell receptor and begin the selection process, and then as they become single positive T cells, they become either CD4 or CD8 positive cells, and then they migrate into the thymic medulla, where they undergo further selection, negative selection, positive selection, before they get released out into the body. And it's in the thymic medulla where we see FOXP3 being expressed for the first time. And that's where the regulatory T cells, the naturally rising regulatory T cells, are generated. And we actually think that the regulatory T cells are actually T cells that have T cell receptors that are a little bit autoimmune, they're not strongly autoimmune, or they would be negatively selected. They would be deleted in the thymus. Um, but they seem to have higher affinity T cell receptors than sort of run-of-the-mill effector T cells. And so it seems that you've got a little bit, um, T cells that have a little bit stronger affinity for maybe self-antigen become regulatory T cells. They express FOXP3, sorry, and they also um, express a number of other interesting molecules. Let me just point some of these out. So CD25, uh, as I've noted, the naturally arising regulatory T cells uh, express C high levels of CD25 at baseline. And remember that CD25 is the alpha chain of the IL-2 receptor. It makes T cells um, very sensitive to the effects of IL-2. And what this does is we know that regulatory T cells, they get generated in the thymus, that FOXP3 gets expressed, but in order for those, we, we know from mouse studies that in order for those regulatory T cells to survive long term and to be able to uh, continue to suppress things and grow, they have to have ongoing IL-2 signals. And they need to be very sensitive to IL-2 because they need to be able to sense even low level IL-2 that's present just in the environment uh, at, at baseline in order to survive and, and mature, okay? And so IL-2 signaling is very important for, for regulatory T cells. Um, now regulatory T cells can, can um, affect uh, the function of target cells in a couple of different ways. One of these 
is through direct cell-cell interactions. Uh, and some of the molecules that are important in these processes are molecules like CTLA-4. CTLA-4 uh, is present on regulatory T cells, uh, even at baseline. And many of you are familiar with CTLA-4 being an immunoregulatory molecule. And so what happens, remember, when antigen-presenting cells present antigen to regular effector T cells, those effector T cells, they need two signals to get activated. They need a signal through the T cell receptor, and then they need a second signal to become fully activated. And that, se that second signal is typically provided by B7 molecules that are on the antigen-presenting cell. So these are CD80 and CD86 that are on the antigen-presenting cell. And those, uh, so here, and those on, on effector T cells, those will bind, of course, to CD28. And so it's these, these interactions between the B7 molecules and CD28 that provide the second signal that T cells need to get activated and grow, start growing. And what CTLA-4 does is that it binds to those B7 molecules and it actually uh, is able to pull those off the surface of the antigen-presenting cells, okay? So it basically makes it so antigen-presenting cells can no longer co-stimulate T cells. So along comes an effector T cell, and the only signal that it gets uh, is through its T cell receptor. It doesn't get that second signal, and so it doesn't actually get activated and doesn't get turned on to become a, a strong effector T cell. And so this is one of the ways that regulatory T cells can do the, can, can um, uh, affect their function is, is by... Um, uh, by util, util, through cell-cell interactions and some of these molecules that they've got on their cell surface that can downregulate directly their target cells. In addition, regulatory T cells can uh, secrete cytokines, immunosuppressive cytokines like interleukin-10, TGF-beta, that can um, suppress other cells that are around them. So they don't necessarily have to be in direct contact with their target cells. They can they can exert what we call bystander regulation just through the secretion of cytokines um, that are suppressive to the immune system. Okay, so, so this will become important as we begin to talk about these uh, other immune dysregulation disorders. So one of the things that we've recognized about this disease with IPEX is that, um, and, and this is uh, data from an autopsy from a child who is the second child in a family that we, we knew of, that we already transplanted uh, one boy in this family, mom got pregnant, and we prenatal diagnosis was performed and, and found that the baby was affected. We'd actually chosen a bone marrow transplant donor. And late in pregnancy, this child, uh, this, this uh, pregnancy uh, started to have problems. And they noted, they were actually worried that the child had a diaphragmatic hernia because they, it looked like the chest was not very well expanded. And so the, the uh, child was, um, at the, the family was actually from San Diego. They actually came here uh, to deliver because we were ready with the bone marrow transplant donor. We were going to do transplant right after birth. And the baby was born and had actually uh, fully developed, except the chest was very small. And the lung size was only about a third the size that it should have been. And, and we just... This child could not be supported from a ventilatory standpoint um, at, at shortly after birth, and he died at 36 hours of age. But um, the parents uh, granted an autopsy, and it turned out that we, we learned some interesting things from this, from this patient. Um, and, and among those are, are this, that, that this process, you know, you think of the uterus um, as being a very immunosuppressed environment because mom, mom's immune system has to be able to tolerate the, this haploidentical baby without rejecting it, okay? And so there's all of these mechanisms in place in the uterus uh, and, uh, and uh, related to the placenta that it controls inflammation and really is, is an immunosuppressive environment. However, this child was 36 hours of age, and, and what we realized here, so, just, um, so here's a normal baby, uh, age-matched control, uh, with the pancreas uh, picture, uh, just H&E stain, and this is a stain for, th th this uh, pancreas was stained for CD3, CD20, CD8, CD4, okay? Similar down here. So here's the infant with IPEX. So 36 hours of age at, 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 uh, at death. And now you note that in the pancreas, look at all of these inflammatory infiltrates. You see lots of inflammatory infiltrates in the pancreas. You see them here. And when those are stained, um, it turns out that there are a lot of 
T cells there. And um, there are CD8s and there are CD4s. And what you note, which is kind of interesting, is that there's these little patches that are free of T cells. And so when you stain for B cells, the B cells stain those patches. And so this looks like sort of an organized inflammation that looks like lymphoid follicles, actually, that have actually developed in the pancreas. So, and we see this in the setting of chronic inflammation. We see this in patients who've got chronic lung inflammatory disease. We see these lymphoid follicle, these follicular-like structures um, developing with B cell zone and a surrounding T cell zone as the immune system begins to organize this inflammatory response. And so that tells us that this process going on in the pancreas of this child actually it wasn't something that had just started when he was born. This was something that has been going on for a while. So, so in the setting of, even in the setting of the, the uterus and the placenta, which are very inexpressive, the baby, you need regulatory T cells to not get autoimmunity. So it tells us that this autoimmunity begins in utero. That's how aggressive this is. That's what happens when you have no regulators. Um, and so it's a very aggressive disease. Um, so these are the patients. This, so, so when we look at our IPEX patients, the, one with, uh, the ones with FOXP3 mutations, this is sort of the, dis the distribution of symptoms that we see. So, so we see uh, a lot, you know, uh, enteropathy in almost all of them. Uh, we see endocrinop endocrinopathies in 70%, um, dermatitis in 90%, and then other autoimmunity in about 75%. And this includes um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, um, kidney disease, liver disease. Uh, some of the patients have seizures and, and some uh, sort of developmental delay. Um, we don't know how much of this is autoimmune versus just metabolic related to the other problems they have. And there are a subset of patients who have pulmonary problems. Um, some of them have pulmonary autoimmunity, and some of them we now have we now know have these hypoplastic lungs, uh, which have now been seen in four patients with this disease. And it's a bad disease. If you have this disease, if you've got a FOXP3 mutation, it's it it does not uh, lend itself to a good outcome in the end. This is taking all comers, even with bone marrow transplant, survival is is still uh, about sixty percent is all. So this is a bad disease to have. And so uh, we have a lot of patients who we've analyzed um, who have FOXP3 mutations uh, that are the IPEX patients, and then patients who've got a clinical phenotype like IPEX that we call IPEX-like because they look like IPEX, but they don't have FOXP3 mutations. Their survival is somewhat better, but still not spectacular. And so, so this, um, these, these patients with severe immune dysregulation are problematic. Now, as I mentioned, we've come to recognize that some of these kids um, can present, or I shouldn't say they present, they present early in life, but they, their diagnosis is only made uh, later in life. And one of the things we've come to realize is that the disease changes a little bit as patients get older. So, so we see uh, that the diarrhea is early, the, the diarrhea is still early onset. They have severe diarrhea in early in childhood, but then um, it's not clear whether they just get better at managing that, or in fact the diarrhea sort of becomes less of a prominent feature as they age. This is one of our patients uh, who underwent bone marrow transplant at 24 years of age, uh, here with Russell Wilson and, and uh, all of his Seahawks gear uh, in the hospital. Uh, the, um, he, uh, he had, and what's, what's evident in a lot of these older IPEX patients is that the GI disease gets a little bit less, but the skin disease gets much worse. So these patients get horrible skin disease. This young man had severe pemphigus nodularis that um, was very resistant to therapy, initially responded to rituximab therapy, but then uh, became very unresponsive. And, and many of these patients have just a severe uh, uh, psoriasiform dermatitis that is just, um, it's, it's just awful, very debilitating in many of the patients. Many of the patients it, it deeply fissured down into the subcutaneous tissue uh, be, because it's such a severe dermatitis. And that seems to become a much more prominent feature of the disease as patients age. Um, we see a, a lot of, again, still a lot of endocrinopathy, and in all of these patients, they're, they're, they've got severe failure to thrive. So, so this, this guy, I think, was uh, 34 kilograms when he came to us as an adult at age 24, uh, so basically half the size of, of, a, of a normal adult male. So, um, so anyway, uh, these patients have a lot, of, a, a lot of problems, and because of all their problems, because of their frequent interactions with the medical care system, you know, they're at high risk of, of dying. And so, like I said, the oldest patient that I, that I know of with this disease died in his early 30s.
So this is not a disease that's compatible with, with long-term life without aggressive therapy. So one of the projects that David Hagen has been working on um, is um, looking in this IPEX-like cohort to try and understand what are the other genes that um, we can uh, find in this, in this group of patients. So what other genes do we need to be thinking about? And so we knew about some of these. We knew about CD25, and I've already explained to you what the role of CD25 is in maintaining a regulatory T cell function over the lifespan. Um, the transcription factor that's downstream of CD25 is STAT5B. I should say downstream of IL-2 signaling is STAT5B. So again, IL-2 signaling problems. Here, we knew about those, and we've known about those for several years now, but over the last little while, the, all of these other genes have become to, uh, to be more prominent as we think about these, uh, these diseases. And so these are, uh, this is a list of the genes that, um, that uh, David has found so far in our IPEX-like cohort. Some of, these, some of this has been done by um, sort of targeted um, sequencing of, of single genes based on some, some symptoms that the patients had have had. Some of this has been done by exome sequencing um, and, uh, and plowing through these patients. Uh, we still got a lot, we've still got a lot more patients to plow through, but, but it's been interesting that um, so far we've got answers in about a third of the ipex light patients um, by doing this sort of sequencing. And, and, the, um, and the question is, what do the other two-thirds have? And I think um, there's some interesting potential hits there that, that David's been working on. Roy, why does the phenotype of this disease change with age? It's not clear, actually. It's one of the questions that um, that uh, I think we, we still need to answer. It's not uh, it's not clear why they move away from the um, from the GI phenotype more to a cutaneous phenotype. You know, the the one thing that I can say is that patients, the older patients, certainly get more savvy about how they manage their their bowel disease. So I had a so I had a patient who who really, I guess, was the one who highlighted this for me, that he, he, was, um, he told me that he would never eat anything after, uh, after 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Because he knew that if he ate anything after 4 o'clock in the afternoon, he would, have, he would stool in his bed. He would have accidents in his bed. And if he, if he ate before 4 o'clock, he could sort of get his bowel cleared out before he went to bed and, uh, and then uh, was okay through the night. And so I think part of it might be that they get better at managing their GI disease, maybe um, figuring out what foods cause them problems. The rate of food allergy in this disease we think is quite high, although I will, I, I will say that there's not been a carefully done study in this population to look at food allergy. <laughs> and, and some of that is just um, positive um, RAS testing, which... I, I would say is not a good test in these patients because their IgEs are typically super high, and so how much of that is real versus you know just just uh, uh, cross reactive uh, IgE in the, in those patients? There are there are certainly several documented cases though where patients um, you know when they transition say from breast milk to cow milk protein or soy protein, they have a dramatic worsening of, of their disease, and and so documented food allergies. In, in some of the patients, and, and that needs to be more carefully looked at. So, so I don't know whether the whether the, the fact that their GI disease gets more manageable is related to their ability to just manage that better and avoid the things that bother them as they get older. And that the you know the skin, of course, you can't do that, and so they have more problems. But I think one one really interesting thing to point out is that you know you think about the place where regulatory T cells are needed sort of all the time. It's at sites where the immune system is being chronically activated by foreign proteins, bacteria, et cetera, et cetera, and it's the gut and the skin. And so when you've got, you know, so it's interesting that when you have regular 3 T cell problems, those are the places that we tend to see things. So it's, 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 it's surfaces where the body comes into contact with antigen. That, that, and, and it's just sort of run-of-the-mill daily antigen that the regulatory T cells are probably most needed for. Yes? Um, I was just wondering along those lines, is there any um, difference going back to the mouse experiment? In symptoms when you inject these disease CD4 cells at different ages in the mice? Um, so that's a great question. Uh, and um, so that, that experiment has not been carefully done that way. What has been done is that there are mice um, that uh, were actually engineered by uh, Sasha Radensky, uh, that ex where the regulatory T cells express uh, the diphtheria toxin receptor. So you can deplete 
the regulatory T cells at any point that you want to. And in the experiment where you, where you deplete those at older ages, it seems to be the same disease. Now, the problem in the mice is that this is a much more fulminant disease. I mean, some of our patients are pretty fulminant. Um, but, but the mice, it's a, it's a very fulminant disease. You, you wipe out their regulatory T cells, and um, they're dead in three weeks. You know? So it's not quite that fulminant in humans. And so um, I think um, nobody has done the experiment where they sort of carefully sort of titrated in maybe diphtheria toxin uh, to, to just partially de deplete the regs, uh, to deplete them, let them come back. Maybe, you know, those experiments have not been carefully done yet. Um, and so it's not clear, you know, it, you can do that. They've done that in older mice, and the phenotype looks like just like the, the young ones. They get sick and they die in about three weeks. So um, if you keep depleting them. Yes. It, seems like, <clears throat> it seems like you have sort of selective success with the bone marrow transplants. Is there any pattern that you see right away to see who's going to do well and who's not going to do well? Yeah, let me come back to that, actually, because as I get to the section on treatment at the end, I'll come back to that and I'll talk about that and what our experience has been and, and the, the other experience. We've now, we've now transplanted 15 patients with IPEX uh, here in Seattle, and, and let, me, let me address that in, in a couple of minutes. It's, it's a good question. Um, any other questions before we move on? So, so, so getting back to this idea of this, these fuzzy phenotypes, these phenoty phenotypic overlaps, you know, you may have recognized some of those genes that I put up as being genes uh, that are involved in other diseases. So, so let me give you some examples here. So, so for instance, we found patients who've got leaky skid who look for the world like IPEX, and they've got RAG1, RAG2 mutations. Uh, TTC7A is a disorder of, um, of, that has a, a bowel component, uh, and it has, uh, in some of these patients, a, a skid-like phenotype in some of the more severe patients, and so there's certainly overlap with skid. Um, there, there's overlap of some of these genes with the ALPS, uh, with Al an ALPS phenotype, and there's an overlap with CVID in, in some of these genes as well. And so, again, the phenotypes of these specific gene defects uh, can vary depending on probably... Many, many things that we don't fully understand. There's probably some modifier genes in some, present in some of these patients that affect how these um, uh, patients present who have mutations in the exact same genes. And, and I think that the important thing in this cohort for us um, in, 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 in terms of trying to study and understand how the human immune system maintains tolerance is this, that, that there are some of these gene defects that clearly affect the function and the development of regulatory T cells. So, for instance, FOXP3, I've talked to you a little bit about the role of CD25 and STAT5B in, in maintaining Treg function. Um, and these are Treg intrinsic defects. So these are defects that affect how Tregs develop and how they function, okay? And uh, then there are a number of defects that are clearly Treg extrinsic. So these are defects that affect um, how the bowel develops and, and how the bowel functions. And so these mutations in TTC37, TTC7A, Mono5B, these are mutations that are associated with bowel developmental defects. Now, they may also have an immune component, but it may be that their main effect in terms of causing the phenotype like IPEX has to do more with their intrinsic bowel defects than it is related to their uh, necessarily their immune system problems or their regulatory T cell problems. And then there are all of these other defects that we don't really know for sure, is this more of a regulatory T cell problem or is this an effector cell problem that maybe they can't respond to the cues that they're getting from the regulatory T cells. So they can't be suppressed maybe in some of these cases we think. Um, and, and so we've got a lot of work to do to try and sort this out a little bit better. Okay, so. I've already talked about the need for ongoing IL-2 signaling. So, so let me talk about some of these, some of these genes and, and highlight some of these. So, so I talked about this, I think, last year, about the, the patients with STAT1 gain-of-function mutations who are originally described with chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. We now have identified a, 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 a several of these patients in our IPEX light cohort, and, and when you look at their clinical features, they look like IPEX with candidal infections. This is what they look like. They've, they've got enteropathy, most of them. They've got endocrinopathies, so diabetes and thyroid disease. They have dermatitis. Uh, they have other autoimmunity. Uh, all of them have other autoimmunity, and the distribution looks pretty similar to what we see in the IPEX patients. 
And most of the patients have chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. And so these are gain-of-function mutations in STAT1. And I talked about these um, a little bit last year, that, that what happens here is that these patients hyperactivate STAT1, and so in, in response to a number of cytokines, and that the the um, and they uh, and so they develop, uh, of course, the CMC, but they also develop autoimmunity and can also present like um, uh, like CVID, as I mentioned. And so these patients, they have regulatory T cells, as shown here. So here's a normal individual, their regulatory T cells. Here's a patient, and the numbers are a little bit low in some patients, but certainly not absent. Uh, and they, uh, when these were isolated and, and in a limited number of studies that have been performed, they, the regulatory T cells seem to function. Um, although I would say that the, the, the jury is still out a little bit on that, but, but the, it seems like this, this might be a defect where the regulatory T cells work, but because of the sort of hyperactivation of this inflammatory pathway that responds to type 1 and, type 1 and type 2 interferons, it may be that the effector cells are so revved up that they can't get suppressed. And so that's one of the questions that we need to answer. Similarly, patients have been identified recently with STAT3 gain-of-function mutations. Now, you may remember Job syndrome or hyper-IgE syndrome. Those patients have lots of function mutations in STAT3, so they've got less STAT3 function than they should have. These patients have gain-of-function mutations in STAT3. So they've got much more STAT3 activity than, their, than, they, than they would have at baseline. And these patients, um, what's interesting is that gain-of-function mutations in STAT3 were described actually uh, 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 several years ago now actually as somatic mutations in patients with certain types of cancer. And so LGL leukemia actually was the first description where they found these gain-of-function mutations in STAT3. And so it was a bit of a surprise when they found these germline gain-of-function mutations in patients who developed um, these sorts of features. So on the left are the, are the gain-of-function mutations in STAT3. These are their clinical features. On the right are the, the features that the loss of function mutations make. So, so remember that the Job syndrome, the hyper-IgE patients, they, get, they have eczema, they have dental problems, they don't lose their primary teeth. They have elevated IgE and eosinophilia, recurrent bacterial infections, and, and particularly problems with staph and, and uh, staph pneumonias. Musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal abnormalities, but patients who've got gain-of-function mutations in STAT3, they present with early-onset autoimmunity. So type 1 diabetes in this original publication, these were patients who had infant-onset type 1 diabetes, autoimmune enteropathy, autoimmune thyroid disease, pulmonary disease, some of them, some of them have arthritis, short stature, and I'll show you a picture of this in a moment, um, eczema, I mean, these are the features of IPEX, right? that these patients have. Now what's interesting is that as more of these patients have been found, it turns out that the phenotypic spectrum of this disease is also quite broad. So I was just at a meeting, and it turns out that in ALPS patients, again, the most common mutation they find is in FAS, and they that's by far and away the most common mutation, but, but then there are patients who have been characterized who have an ALPS-like phenotype, but they don't have mutations in FAS or FAS ligand. And it turns out that the gene defect that they're finding most frequently in that population now, STAT3 gain of function. So now it's an ALPS gene. And we're also finding it in patients with CVID, who've got CVID with the more complicated autoimmune phenotype. So, so again, the spe these patients can present as IPEX, CVID, ALPS, so it's this big phenotypic spectrum again, this Fuzzy phenotypes related to the mutations in the same gene. Okay? So, so these are STAT3 gain of function mutations, and interestingly, not very many of these patients so far, a few of them have gone on to develop LGL leukemias, but most of them have not. And so why is it that in one setting you get LGL leukemias as a somatic mutation, maybe it's the other bits that they get that, that drive that, uh, and, and in the setting of germline mutations, uh, not so much. Okay, so, so these are the clinical features, and, and I've already gone through these um, you know, enteropathy and, and, and diabetes and alopecia and all these, all these things that we see in the IPEX light cohort. <coughs> Here's the growth phenotype. This young woman is a girl that we uh, became acquainted with uh, many years ago, actually, when she was an infant and presented just like IPEX. And when we did flow cytometry, she had very low regulatory T cells. We sequenced FOXP3, you know, she's a girl, so it didn't make a lot of sense, but, you know, just wanted to rule that out. Of course, it was normal. Um, and because of her growth phenotype, we thought maybe she was going to be a STAT-5B patient because they have a severe growth phenotype. 
We sequenced it. I actually made my technician go back and resequence it because I said, she has to be a staph IV. She's so small. She's got that growth phenotype. She resequenced it. She said, no, it really is normal. And, uh, and it turns out that she has a STAT3 gain of function mutation. Okay, so, so this is her here with a backpack on, okay? And she is now 12 in this picture, okay? And uh, this is her 16-year-old sister. And uh, they're, they're going camping. Now, she underwent bone marrow transplant at age 5 and is doing great from an autoimmunity standpoint. She, her autoimmunity is completely resolved, but she continues to be tiny. And the, gro the, the growth phenotype in this disease is not clear uh, why it's uh, so severe. Um, I also talked about this disease last year briefly. This is haploinsufficiency of CTLA-4. Remember I told you that CTLA-4 is one of the important molecules that Tregs use to directly suppress target cells. And so if you mutate uh, just one copy of CTLA-4 in humans, they develop this lymphoproliferative disease where they get these massive, and, and look at these infiltrates. So, so does this look familiar based on what I just showed you in the pancreas of the IPEX patient? So, so T cell zone, B cell zone. Um, and, and so this, these sort of chronic inflammatory infiltrates. And in the CTLA-4 patients, you see these in the lungs. So they lung nodules, they get them in the brain. These look like brain tumors, and then they biopsy them. It's just lymphocytic infiltrates. They get them in the gut. And so this is, you know, this looks like bad CVID nodule, lung nodules is what it looks like. And, and many of these patients, again, live in the CD, CVID sort of group. But in addition, we find them in the IPEX light group. So, so it's, you, get, you get this picture that, that complicated CVID, so CVID with the, all of the autoimmunity that they get, and IPEX light patients, it's this sort of huge phenotypic overlap. And I, and I think it's... It's, you know, I've only come to realize this over the last couple of years, I think, that, they, that, that many of these, the, these gene defects really live in both camps, and there's, there's a lot more similar about those patients than there are different. And so these are the features of patients with CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency. Again, very IPEX-like, diarrhea and enteropathy, um, lung, dis, uh, lung infiltrates and autoimmunity, organ infiltration, bone marrow, kidney, brain, liver, um, autoimmune uh, hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, um, and uh, autoimmune uh, thyroid disease, and some of the patients have diabetes. So it looks, again, like IPEX, uh, but these patients also, many of them have, uh, over time, they, they, they lose their B cells and they develop hypogammaglobulinemia. And I'll just uh, sort of, end, sort of uh, the last one I'll talk about is LRBA deficiency. LRBA is this large molecule. We, we didn't know a ton about what it looked like, but we knew that we were finding these patients in the CVID cohort, the CVID patients, who had the complicated phenotype, and we found them in our IPEX light cohort. And in this paper that was just published this last year, it showed that they showed that LRBA is actually required for the recycling of CTLA-4 back out to the surface of the cells. It binds to a uh, motif on the cytoplasmic tail of CTLA-4, and it recirculates it back out to the cell surface to maintain the cell surface levels of CTLA-4. So, Again, this is kind of a CTLA-4 uh, insufficiency disease, uh, again. So, so this is LRBA deficiency, okay? So, so these are the IPEX-like uh, defects, and to sort of compare them, there's a lot here, I apologize, but, but, um, but just noting those across the top, and, and many of the features are similar. I just want to sort of end by talking a little bit about treatment. So, so treatment for these diseases, you need to be very aggressive in your supportive care. Number one, you've got to identify the disease and then you've got to be very aggressive in your supportive care. So aggressive nutritional support. That means you might actually have to put in a central line and give them TPN to actually get them to grow and gain weight. All of these patients, before they come to bone marrow transplant, you ask one of the things that pretends bad outcome in bone marrow transplant, it's poor nutritional status and, and poor, many, many of these patients by the time they come to transplant are in really bad shape. So we uh, sometimes bring them in the hospital inpatient for, we, we gone as long as six weeks before the bone marrow transplant, to aggressively, um, you know, we put in a line, give them lots of calories, beef them up a little bit to give them a little bit of nutritional reserve. We've had to get our, because of the severe uh, skin disease that some of these patients have, um, we've had to get our burn uh, team uh, involved to deal with some of the, our wound care team to deal with some of the severe dermatitis that these patients have to get that sealed up so that it's not a port of entry for organisms. Um, you need to be aggressive about your care of their, their um, uh, um, endocrinopathies. And, uh, and 
one of the things that we sometimes forget is, is dental care. Many of these patients have a, a lot of problems uh, in their mouth, and, and this, of course, can be a portal of entry for, for uh, bacteria and, and other problems. And then, of course, we get these patients started on aggressive immune suppression. And so I, you know, I think the key here is to be as targeted, targeted as you possibly can. So, so in the case of IPEX, where we know that the disease is, you know, from the mouse models, we know that if you take those scurfy T cells, you put them in a, and you put them in a, a, a um, in a lipopenia mouse, they develop the disease. So we know that the disease is driven by out of control T cells. So we use T cell directed immune suppression. So that's our first therapy, first line of therapy. So so we use FK506, cyclosporin. We use tacrolimus. Uh, I'm sorry, we use sirolimus, um, and we we aggressively immu uh, immunosuppress these patients. In the patients with CTLA4 papillinsufficiency or with LRBA deficiency. Our go-to drug now, again, is we give them some CTLA-4 back. So we give them a Batacept, okay? So CTLA-4 IG, we try to load them up with CTLA-4. And in some of those patients, it's very effective. Not all of them, but some of those patients, it works really quite nicely, okay? Um, and so, you know, being as targeted as you can possibly, possibly be. There are some patients um, with uh, STAT-1 gain-of-function mutations that have been trialed on JAK inhibitors. Uh, there have been limited... There's limited experience, but there's at least two patients that have that have had good responses who their autoimmunity. Um, there are others who didn't. The patients who had more problems with infections, and, and they had more problems with their infections. So, so that's uh, one one issue. And then the early the other thing about these patients is early bone marrow transplant. And most of these patients, um, you can treat with these re with a reduced intensity approach. And let me just show you quickly uh, what's been done here. So, so these are the patients that we have uh, transplanted. Uh, here in Seattle. We've used three different regimens. Uh, this is um, one patient done with a uh, busulfan cytoxan ATG. This is a myeloablative regimen. And there were some complicating reasons that we had to use a myeloablative regimen in, in this patient because his only possible donor was a four out of six cord. And with, with cord blood uh, grafts, you have to be very, you have to be aggressive in your conditioning regimen. And he died of, um, of uh, transplant-related complications and severe graft-versus-host disease. And he is the only patient that we have lost out of the 15 patients uh, during the bone marrow transplant protocol. And it highlights the fact that, uh, that's that been seen uh, in, in, other, in, uh, in other patients with IPEX. And getting back to what sort of portends about a bad outcome of transplant in these patients. And one of those, yeah, I think, is the conditioning regimen. They, these patients have not done well with myeloablative conditioning. They really need a reduced intensity regimen. I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm a stronger believer than ever in, the, in that with these patients. Sometimes we don't have a choice, as was the case with this child. It was our one chance, and he was not doing well otherwise. He was not going to, he, he was not going to have a long life without a transplant, and so this was sort of a salvage therapy, uh, and, uh, and unfortunately he died. Um, Using a reduced intensity regimen, however, outcomes are much better. And so we've used this reduced intensity regimen and a minimal intensity regimen even in all of these patients, and they have done uh, much better. They've done well, and we've had, uh, uh, we've had very good success in these patients. Ranging, patients ranging in age from under a year of age up to uh, 23 years of age, uh, we've done. Okay, so IPEX works. Now, I want to just highlight that we've also been collecting the, the transplant experience from around the world. Uh, for, uh, for these other IPEX-like diseases. And so we've just collected and submitted, actually just resubmitted the paper, uh, CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency. So five patients transplanted in Newcastle. These patients, all but one of these patients was actually coincidentally transplanted for severe autoimmune disease before we knew they had CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency. So four, uh, five patients transplanted in England, three patients transplanted here. Uh, David actually identified all of those patients uh, post, uh, after transplant. And, um, and these patients have done very well, actually, in that cohort, the majority of them. LRBA deficiency, so far we know about, uh, of about five patients who have been transplanted, um, and uh, very mixed results in LRBA deficiency. We're just in the process of gathering this, this data, and I think um, the, the story is still out on that. Um, and then, of course, uh, we've also, sorry, looked at uh, STAT1 gain-of-function mutations. We've now collected 12 patients from around the world. Outcomes in this disease, this is a tricky disease to transplant and only 50% survival in this. So this one I think the jury's still out on. We're getting ready to submit this paper. And the STAT3 gain-of-function patients, we're at six patients uh, from around the world. And outcomes with this disease seem to be quite good. So anyway, we're learning 
more about how to manage these patients, but certainly bone marrow transplant for the patients with severe disease uh, is an, an option. And some, some of these do better than others. We don't yet understand fully why, but we're trying to sort that out with these studies. So just in summary, we've talked about the background of these immune dysregulation disorders. We've um, talked about the fact that you, know, you, you suspect these disorders in patients who've got early onset autoimmunity or syndromic autoimmunity, autoimmunity that's poorly responsive to, early, to, to usual therapies. And like I said, these patients live in our rheumatology clinics, GI clinics, hematology clinics, because they've got recurrent, you know, they've got Evans syndrome or some other thing. So these patients, you know, are out there. And I, can, I, can, I know that they're out there because we've, we've seen several of them here. Uh, and some of you have, have, have had a chance to see some of these patients. Um, and then aggressively try to find the underlying mechanisms, the genetics and the functional testing, some of the things that I've shown you. And then, and then treatment needs to be very aggressive with these patients. You, you know, these, these are the patients that, that live in that CVID, that complicated CVID cohort, and, and it feels uncomfortable to take a patient who's got an immune deficiency and aggressively immunosuppress them. It does give you pause, I would say. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but, but you have to do it because it's critical to their survival. These are bad diseases. Patients don't do well in the long run. And so we need to, um, you know, my, my um, sort of uh, encouragement would be to uh, jump on those patients early, be aggressive about finding out what they've done, or what's going on with them, and then try to treat them uh, aggressively and, and hopefully give them a, a life-changing uh, curative therapy. I just want to acknowledge everybody who's played a role in this. All of the folks in, in my lab, and particularly uh, in this project, David Hagen, who's really done a, a spectacular job and continues to, to work on this and, um, and uh, is really uh, um, leading uh, some of this new work. Um, collaborators, of course, uh, and, and all of our colleagues in immunology, transplant, and, and infectious diseases who, who played a role in the things I presented. So anyway, I'll keep in, in there and be happy to take any questions. I mean, what, what always strikes me with this is we focus on the genetics, and now we a lot with epigenetics, <clears throat> but the need for a more functional assay, which you didn't address as much. And I know David uh, and you have been developing with SAT1 and SAT3, you know, really looking at phosphorylation uh, over time. And I'm curious the extent to which you've sort of tried to quantify that. And then to apply it to, for example, the ipex light cohort and say, well, even though we can't find a genetic defect, we see know, uh, a specific percent of increase or decrease in phosphorylation, and then even to go beyond that and apply it to sort of just all those patients who are in rheumatology or GI clinics who share features, specifically because we have, you know, such potentially targeted therapies there to really try to personalize their students and their patients. Because what always strikes me, there was a, a great talk at BRI last week out at Northwestern and UCSF, you know, it used 10 years ago or the last 10 years ago, GWAS, and now it's all epigenetics, but what we really want is functionally how do these patients differ and how that is going. So I don't, I don't know if you guys have really started to try to quantify that or if you've applied those assays to the whole ipex like cohorts or to other cohorts. So we, so we've begun, I mean, we haven't, I would say that we've not, so David's done a fantastic job of developing the assays. I don't know that we've, that they're particularly quantitative. What we've really been focused on is do they, do they segregate with patients with known disease? Right. So that's really been the first focus. And, um, and then I think, uh, and, and then, then they seem to segregate, certainly the stat one gain of function test seems to segregate quite nicely with patients who've got, who've got disease. What's interesting is that we've, we've got at least one patient who seems to have a stat one uh, gain of function sort of phenotype, but no mutation, uh, and the, no stat one gain of function mutation. I mean, any, any, would you comment, would you say anything else, David? They were also limited by the number of cells that you can do. If you can run something on all of them, can do other tests on all the patients. You don't have enough cells to do it, and I, I don't know if it will make sense. I mean, STAT1 is unique in that, uh, in that regard because we can get the same thing with STAT3, and so far we don't have a good readout for CTLA4. We can just do the same for all of them and expect to see something. See, but it seems like such a fine dial. I mean, the fact that we see sort of gain of function, loss of function in, both, in all these stats, mm -hmm. and it's so finely tuned, you'd think that a lot of, you know, that may be a really critical yeah, we see that with stat one. I didn't see it with yeah. that. Well, with I mean, stat. just seeing the gain of function stat three now. Yeah, but you can see the same thing. You can't see it at the, no. at the, no, the, the same way. way. 
So we're struggling with sort of a functional assays, but you're absolutely right. There's, there, I mean, the thing about it is with genetics is that, you know, you do these, you do exome sequencing, you get all these hits, and then the question becomes, which one of those is actually relevant? And so having, we actually need more functional studies now with the genetics than we than before. Uh, and so I think, but it gets back to, you know, maybe technologies that, that you're using, actually, Matt, which is the yep. gene transcription profiling, you know, maybe that's going to be more quantitative uh, than, say, a flow assay. It's, it's not clear, but I think we need to think about these, these sort of broad kind of functional screens as being ways to look. And I think, you know, the idea of applying these to broader cohorts um, that live in other patient population, uh, you know, the, the, say the GI clinic or the, is actually a, a really, a, you know, it's a very interesting thought. Um, and I think, um, it, you know, it's going to be the thing that we'll do in the future. But, uh, because I think genetic, genetics is only going to get us so far. We, you know, we're finding the defect in, in a quarter to a third of patients with very clear phenotypes. Right. And, the, and the others, we're not finding the defects. And so the question is, what do they have? They've got to have something because they've got early onset disease. They phenotypically, they look just like all the patients who've got you know, who've got disease onset in infancy. They've, it's almost certain that they've got a genetic defect. The question is, where the heck is it? And how do we zone in on that? Or in the sort of numerous genes together. Right? Yes. Well, we really need a, a haplotype, yeah. And, you know, mm -hmm. sort of start to dissect out what the pathway is. Yeah. That's, that's my thought. Or, or even with now the epigenetics, like what Alex was showing last week, is, you know, you'll see many of these modifications and how to actually tie it into the functional. Because this is not a functional essay, this that one. What's that? The stat one is not a functional essay. Well, I mean, read some response, so I if you could qu quantitate it to some extent, I mean, I wonder even if in the stat ones if you correlate it with severity, severity or I things like that. You get too you much variability between each, uh, each time you run the test. I think, again, if you can read something that would be more common, like transcriptome in response stimulation, maybe you can hit more than one disease at the same time. <laughs> and we should see, you know, there should be quite a significant transcriptional signature in these patients. I would think yeah. if you took them at resting and hit them with a little bit of IL-27 or interferon gamma, you should see a really distinct transcription, yeah. transcriptional signature. Yeah. At, at a, you know, at the, at the right time, choose the right time point, my guess is it would it, be very distinct in these patients. Mm -hmm. yeah. That would be more functional, checking actually what downstream to the so that, And we sort of looked at that, I mean, because that one stat one family mm -hmm. I did end up running. All right, thank you. All right, thanks, guys. All right. Appreciate it.